Well, this morning I brought a couple different types of calculators to talk about calculations and equations. And the first calculator that might have ever been used was in the Garden of Eden. Could have been. Could have been these rocks. See, I, I, I can just imagine Adam saying to Eve, look Eve, see that peach tree over there? There's three peaches on it, and each one of these rocks represents one of those peaches. And then he said, you know, you see that tree over there? That pear tree? Well, these two rocks represent the pears. And, and Adam was pretty proud of it, so he said, Eve, these, we got three peaches and two pears. We've got a total of five good pieces of good fruit. And to that, Eve said that she really wasn't that impressed because she said, you know, I've been talking to that serpent guy and he offered me one apple and I don't need your rocks to do math because all I really want is that one apple. You want some? Well, on the screen there is a more advanced calculator. Up on the right there is actually an abacus. And I actually had some people trying to find me one of those that I could demonstrate today, but there's not many of them around anymore. I vaguely remember those being in grade school when I was there. There's a slide rule there, which is in the top left. That is a tool that was used by engineers as late as the 80s to do very complex math equations. Of course, I've got up here an electronic calculator. This one's really fancy because it's even got a paper feed so that you can print out your calculations. When I was in high school, my senior year for Christmas, my parents gave me a portable calculator. It was about this big, it cost almost $80. It would add, it would subtract, it would multiply and divide, and it would even do square roots. I was a technology leader in my high school physics class. Everybody thought I was so cool. Well, not me. These days, though, most of us carry a calculator around in our pocket, and I've got mine here. With, with this calculator, I can take pictures, I can do math, I can take videos, I can surf the web, I can send texts to my friends, I can use it to show me how to drive places when I don't have directions so I don't have to stop and ask for help. I can read books on it. In fact, I've got my Bible on here that I can read. And there's, there's all other sorts of fun things to do on this calculator, like play games. And what's so amazing is with this calculator, I can even call people on the phone. It's impressive. Well, there's a couple reasons that I brought these calculators with me this morning. You see, a few months back, <clears throat> I needed to do some long division, and I couldn't find a calculator. And it's embarrassing, but when I sat down to do it on paper, it took me a moment or two to remember how to do long division. I guess it had been so many years since I'd done long division on a calculator, I'd gotten that dependent. I realized that it's always good to get back to the basics of math. And that's kind of similar to what we've been doing with this series the past couple weeks with Francis Chan. We're getting back to the basics of the question, who is God? And as we answer that question, it should affect how we live. Now, I've actually had a couple people ask me if this series is going to dig deep, if it's going to really dig deep into Scripture and get beyond the basics. And, and I had to say, you know what, in a sense, it's not. Now, I know that digging deep is, is very important and we should do that, but we always have to come back to the basics. See, I don't know anybody, not one person who has perfectly mastered the basics of following Christ. Jesus himself said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not obey my teaching? Well, the second reason that I brought these calculators with me this morning is that Jesus was very clear on what it took to follow him. And following Jesus can be broken down and actually be as simple as a calculation. This week, if you go to one of our classes, Francis Chan is going to remind you of some of those very clear teachings of Jesus. For example, Francis is telling us Jesus said, love your enemies. So it's clear that to 
follow Jesus, we should love our enemies. Jesus said, give to the poor. So we should give to the poor. Jesus said that we're to love God, and so it's obvious we should love God. But Jesus also said, follow me. He told us to make disciples, which is the word used to describe a person who follows Jesus in the most simplest sense. Now on your bulletin insert this morning, I've got two equations to calculate what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And one of the calculations is a, a faulty calculation, and the other represents an accurate calculation. Now these equations come from Jesus' words, or in the words of Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 34, which reads, And he called to, called to him the crowds with the disciples, and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. You can make that into a very simple equation. Being just Jesus' disciple equals denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. But the fact is, is that we have to understand some of those terms. We have to understand what it means to deny ourselves. We have to understand what it means to, to take up our cross. And so this morning I'm going to present one way to calculate the meaning of discipleship, which may not be the right way. It's this equation. Discipleship equals self-punishment plus deliberate, deliberate suffering plus miserable living. You have to ask yourself, is that equation correct? See, Jesus' words say that we're to deny ourselves. And those words that we're to deny ourselves could be twisted around to look like self-punishment. Let's face it, you know, we've all probably seen people going into churches who look gloomy. And if we didn't know anything about church, we might assume that they look gloomy because they've got all these rules about church that they have to follow. And those rules rob all the joy from their life. You know, right off the bat, one of those rules might be that they have, they have to go to church. Another rule could say that they can't go out and get drunk. They might have a rule that says that they have to wait until after marriage to have sex. They have rules maybe that say you got to give money to the church. And you might guess that if you didn't know anything about church that there's a lot of other rules that mean you have to give up a whole bunch of other fun stuff. And so if denying yourself is about keeping the rules, it sounds like self-punishment. Now the second term in this equation is deliberate suffering. And that's related to taking up your cross. If you know anything at all about Jesus, you know that he was crucified. He was stripped naked, he was nailed up to a cross, and he died due to blood loss and asphyxiation. And it was a horrific way to die. And the Romans, the Romans who carried this out were masters at crucifixion. See, those who were crucified were put on the display as a, as a public deterrent. Sometimes they would leave the body up there for days just to make a point. See, the message of, of the, the Roman Empire was this. If you mess around with the Roman government, crucifixion is a consequence. Now, I have to tell you, it's good news because we don't have to worry about this today. Because even if our government was like the Romans... With all the budget battles going on, our government doesn't have the money to buy the wood to make a cross, and they probably don't have the money to pay the manpower to uh, put a person up on the cross. Back to our equation. The thinking goes if Christians are told to take up their cross, it must mean they get a kick out of suffering. They, they suffer deliberately. And that brings us to the last factor in this equation, which says, where Jesus says, follow me. And in this equation, if you look at those first two factors of self-punishment and deliberate suffering, you might conclude that following Jesus leads to a miserable life. 
And so if this calculation up there is correct, theologian Hans Beyer says the follower of Christ must be a person who kills any joy in their life. I hope you know that this is an incredibly and terribly faulty calculation. The true followers of Christ that I know are people who are filled with joy. They're not always happy, but they are joy-filled. It, it bubbles out of them. And they are a lot of fun, too. See, the, the truth, though, about being a disciple of Jesus Christ is actually even more radical than that faulty equation. And what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that being a disciple of Jesus Christ is actually more difficult than punishing ourselves with deliberate suffering. And that, that might sound strange, that may not make sense to you, but think about it this way. When we punish ourselves and when we deliberately suffer, we're still in control. And we love to be in control. To follow Jesus is to give up control. And it's difficult. But it's the only way to life. It, it leads to the life that we were created to live. It's, it's a great life. So that brings us to the accurate calculation of discipleship, which comes from this equation here. Discipleship equals surrendering our self-sufficiency, living sacrificially, and true life. And that is what Jesus meant when he said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We'll start off with denying ourselves. Put simply, denying ourselves means that we are no longer our own. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes this. He says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And what he's saying there is that Jesus bought us. He bought our freedom by going to the cross, by paying the penalty for our sins. And the idea here is that we need to be willing to surrender our independence. We need to be able to give up our self-reliant attitude, and we need to turn it all over to Jesus. It really isn't self-punishment. It is a release of control. It's a release of our personal rights, and we turn our life over to Christ. And I know people, we struggle with surrender. And the fact is, is that for some of us, Surrender can be extremely difficult, but it shouldn't be. You know, if you've been here with us the last couple of weeks, you know we've been talking about God, and we've been talking about how He's mighty and He's powerful, and that He is to be feared. But we've also been talking about the same powerful, mighty God loves us. And if we start with that foundation of His power and His love, we should not fear giving Him control of our life. Let me say it again just, just a little bit differently. If we really believe that God is all-powerful, and if we really believe that God loves us like He would love His children and that we truly are His adopted children, and if we believe that God is in control of everything, then shouldn't we be able to give our life over to Him? Shouldn't we trust Him? Because he's all powerful and because he loves us. Closely related to this idea of denying ourselves is the action of taking up our cross, our living sacrificially. See, when Jesus' disciples heard those words, take up your cross, they had an instant picture of what it meant. I mean, they lived and they knew the Romans, they knew it was execution by crucifixion. Jesus gave his life for us as the ultimate sacrifice. His death and his resurrection give us life. And living sacrificially, or taking up our cross, centers on loving God and loving others. Jesus said it this way. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Apostle Paul put this into very practical terms in regards to loving other people. 
He wrote this, he says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. To live sacrificially means that we put loving God and, and loving others first. It means that one of the things that, that it plays out practically is we serve others. And we even have a problem with serving others at times because we've probably all been there. We're serving others, but we make it all about us. You know, if, if we're helping someone over time and we keep doing things for them and they don't seem to appreciate it, they don't take it, they take us for granted, we might decide that, you know what, we're going to stop helping them. I've done that. My guess is that many of you have done that. And yet the Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Jesus sacrificed his life, he gave his life for a bunch of people who were still disobeying him. It's, it's all I can say is, how's that for a lack of appreciation? Jesus died to give us life. And in turn, we're called to give our life to Christ. Mark 8, Mark 8 35 says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever who loses his life for my sake, and that's Jesus talking, whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And so the basics of following Jesus means that we must die to our own way of life, which was all about you, about us. And in return, we're given a new life. And that life is the last factor in our discipleship equation. It's true life. True life is not possible without surrender and sacrifice. And so if you, you think about the math, the math doesn't really work out perfectly in this equation. But it does work out to the perfect life. See, true life is a life that's God-dependent. It depends on God for everything. And, and true life is a God-centered life. It's all about Jesus. We follow the will of Christ. We're freed to live as we were created to live. It's a life of adventure. It's a life of doing good deeds. It's a, it's a life that imitates Christ. And, and the fact of the matter is, is with this life, we become whole as we begin to more strongly reflect the love of God. That's true life. That is discipleship. And that's the life that, that I want to live, and I hope that that's the life that all of us want to live. Now, in this church, I have witnessed that same true life in Christ. Over the, over the past few weeks, life in this church has been really tough. We've had to say goodbye to a couple of wonderful, godly men in our congregation. This past Friday, after the funeral services for Al Spence, Al's family was back at church out in the parking lot, and I went out to talk to them. And Al's son, Larry, pulled me aside, and he said, you know, when I sat in the pew this morning during the service, I realized why we could never get Dad to move closer to family. He says it was this church. This church was his family. Al's daughters had already told me the same thing. They were amazed at this church's loving family character. Both daughters agreed that Bethesda was the best church they ever, ever visited. And I agree, our strong sense of family in this church is amazing. But what I find even more exciting is our family character is now combining with our call to discipleship in Jesus Christ. Because if you think about it, families are the best to raise up a follower of Christ, whether it's our family in our household or it's our church family. We're equipped to raise up the next generation of believers. And discipleship is growing in this church. I want to share some examples of how discipleship is growing. People are continuing to give their time to make sandwiches and to serve meals to the poor. 
others bringing food on a weekly basis for those facing tough times. It seems like we're trying to follow Jesus' call to feed the hungry. Last Wednesday evening, counting our kids' club and our adult classes and a new high school group that was meeting, we had probably 60 people who were learning about Jesus. There were probably another 20 people singing to the Lord in choir practice. Earlier that same day, Wednesday, we had another 16 adults gathered for a lunchtime Bible class. And if you add to that the staff that was here and the volunteers that were here, we actually had over 100 people here last Wednesday at church. Serving the Lord, following the Lord, growing in Christ. True life in Christ shows up every morning in our teachers and in our ushers and our choir and our, our band and our church council and our greeters and those who help with coffee and with the donut hour. Each one of those roles provides the opportunity for people to grow in their faith. We have a cards team which brings the hope of Christ to those people who might be hurting. We have a real moms group that reaches out to moms of young children. We have a prayer team. We have other women's ministries that help those follow people follow Christ. We have a missions committee that is spreading the gospel around the world. We have volunteers that take up a week of their life to serve at vacation Bible school or to go to camp where kids learn about Jesus. Teens and adults spend a week of their summer to go to work camps and on mission trips. Other people are here to maintain this facility and make sure that our ministries keep operating. In a couple weeks, we're going to have a picnic. And what a great opportunity for this picnic for us to reach out to bring new families into this church so that we can disciple them. In all of these act activities, when given over to Jesus Christ, can help others follow Christ and help us grow too. And if you want to be a part of one of these activities in this church and you're not already doing it, talk to me. We'll get you involved. Following Jesus certainly means that we pray. It also means we study His Word. But when we do that, after we do that, we put what we've learned and what we've heard from God into practice. We obey His teaching. We surrender our self-sufficiency. We live sacrificially. And in doing so, we discover true life. We discover the life we were created to live. And the fact of the matter is, it's not always easy, is it? Jim Elliott was a missionary, many of you have probably heard of, who died while serving the Lord. And Jim said it this way. He said, he is no fool who gives what he can, cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he can never lose. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to give him your life. There's no other way around it. But in return, Jesus gives you a new life. It's an amazing life, and it's a life that's lived to the glory of God. Let us pray. Father, we remember Jesus walking along the Galilee, the shore of the Galilee. And he said to some fishermen, follow me. And they left their nets, they left everything, and they followed him. God, they set an example for us. We want to follow you. But yet when we begin to follow you, so many times we struggle. We want to maintain control. We want to do things the way we want to do them. We're not always confident in following your will. Father, give us strength, give us courage, give us boldness to be your people. Forgive us when we fail. Help us get back on our feet again. Help us to live the life, the abundant life, which Jesus promised. Amen.